Welcome to Our Modern Heritage, the Home and Family Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jody Chafee. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Araya Naruzi. Dr. Araya has a PhD in psychology with a focus on mindfulness. She is a certified life coach, mindful living, conscious parenting speaker, and conscious teacher and corporate mindful, mind, mindfulness trainer. <laughs> she combines science with heart-based tools to create a transformational and tangible impact on her clients. She is endorsed by Dr. Shivali Tabari and founder of Conscious Parenting and Oprah's favorite parenting expert. So welcome, Dr. Araya. So excited to have you here. <laughs> it's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. So this is exciting because I love, you know, I've, I've been studying parenting for as long as I can remember and, you know, just learning about child development and all this stuff. And then I recently did read Dr. Shafali's book, The Awakened Family. And, um, you know, if I didn't know enough about like mindfulness or meditation or these kinds of things, like, I think that I would be like, wow, this is, it would like completely blow my mind. And it did. But it was like, I, I want more people to understand that this is something that's like this whole idea of conscious parenting and, and what that means as far as like being present and open and mindful in your parenting. I'm, so I'm excited to talk with you about this because it's something that's like, wow, this, it, reading that book and learning about conscious parenting like completely transformed my perspective and my outlook on parenting and parenthood. So Tell us more about like, what does it mean? Um, how did you get into conscious parenting to study that as a, as a practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I have a 12 year old daughter and a 10 year old son. And uh, when my son was born, I'm the only child. So I had no idea what to do with a sibling rivalry. So that was the time that I had to read all these parenting books, like 50, 60, 70 of them. I went to conferences. I even had parent coaches come to my uh, house. It was just, it, it, everything worked except, you know, it worked for one day or so. <laughs> uh -huh. So, yeah. So, and then until five years ago, I um, kind of resigned from my corporate job. Um, I, I have a master's degree in computer engineering. So I was in a completely different field. And then when I resigned, I kind of paused because I thought that was not my, my route to take until I die. So I kind of paused right. for a month. I kept asking questions. I let the universe um, tell me, talk to me. I actually interviewed 20, 30 people I knew from childhood. I asked them, what do you think I'm good at? You literally asked them this question, the people I haven't talked for 10 years. Um, some of them said, I'm a good teacher. Um, so I was pretty open. I had no agenda. I just had three actual criteria. I really wanted to help the world in a meaningful way. I wanted to use my potential every day and I really wanted to enjoy what I was doing every day. That was, those were my three criteria. So that was it. And after months, um, I became a, a customer of a life coaching company. Uh, so I got service from them. And then after that, they said, oh, you wanna be a coach? So I said, okay. So I became yes. a certified life coach. Then my coach introduced Dr. Shefali to me because my triggers were my daughter's jealousy towards my son and my, my anger and my reactivity, my yelling. Yeah. I didn't know how to handle the situation. Um, so that was my way of handling, yelling and you know, getting mad and uh, getting triggered. Um, so he introduced Dr. Shefali to me. And then I researched, uh, you know, I searched her name on Google. I found her TED Talk. That's what popped up. I watched it, I cried the whole time, and I fell <laughs> yeah. in love. I became an avid student, I'm on all her conferences. Uh, I've taken all her courses, and um, I'm endorsed by her. She gave me a video testimonial. Um, I was actually listening to her an hour ago. Um, so, um, I, what happened to you, the same thing happened to me, because it was a shift in perspective. Because yeah. we, uh, traditional parenting, the parent is, is like a hierarchical model. So the yep. parent is the authority, is the top-down model. And we expect our children to obey. And even now that I'm teaching, it's still at the back of my mind that they have to obey. They have to listen to me. But conscious parenting changes the perspective. that says we are all 
say we are all souls that have the same value. We are equal in value. And we have just a tiny bit more experience, which is not necessarily good because mm -hmm. we have more programming to reprogram. Mm, so yeah. we become this open, um, you know, ushers, open coaches, not only to coach them, but to coach ourselves. Yeah. And the way conscious parenting works when we get triggered, and this is the base of, I um, you want to call it Buddhism, because this, this yeah. conscious parenting is based on Buddhism. She's not a Buddhist, but the, it's the, the principle of Buddhism, that everything that is in our circle, every, everyone and everything, if they trigger us, it means they are showing um, a wound in us. They're just poking a wound that was actually made from zero to six years old. 95% wow. of our programming is made in from zero to six years old. So anyone or anything that bothers us, and that triggers us, just poking those wounds in us. They're not creating the wound themselves. So when we have that perspective, when I get triggered with my child, and I'm getting angry. Okay, what is the wound? Most probably it's the wound of being out of control. They don't listen to me. I feel out of control. Just when we were out of, we felt out of control from zero to six years old because because of unconscious parenting, they didn't know themselves as parents. They didn't, um, you know, they didn't do it on purpose. Let me just take out my, my um, to make a noise here. Um, oh. So, thank you. <laughs> is it better? Sorry, it was yeah, making. I noise. didn't notice. I didn't notice. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> So, uh, yeah, so wh why am I being triggered? Okay, I'm feeling out of yeah. control. Let me just take a break. Let me pause. Go back to my inner child. My inner child is hurting right now. My inner child is feeling out of control because of the current circumstances. The same memory in childhood is being triggered. That's why I'm triggered. So I'm just going to connect to my heart. I'm going to take care of my inner child. Uh, I offer a lot of tools to take care of that, but the best way is to just Take deep breaths and just um, embrace your inner child. Feel your feeling, whatever feeling is. I'm feeling out of control. Just allow yourself to feel your feeling. And believe it or not, I'm going to ask you, what's, what do you think the maximum duration of each emotion is? Like if you fully feel it until it's done, it's just dissipated. How long does it take you? Um, I think it depends on how practiced you are at under at being able to recognize and uh, so let's imagine you recognize what feeling okay. it is. If I can recognize it, um, and it, sometimes it can be pretty quick. Like if I can recognize it and go, oh, that's anger. I need a couple minutes, maybe a couple minutes, I'd say. Yeah. To like calm down or, it, you know, something like that. Or if, um, it depends because I think some range of emotions, like sometimes sadness lasts, takes a lot longer to get over. <laughs> Um, These are good in my opinion <laughs> yeah yeah but, yeah yeah that's, that's, those are good estimations good answers but the thing is that if we know how as you said recognize what the feeling is really can pinpoint what it is because we just have we just know bad mad sad angry we just know a couple of feelings but guess what we have hundreds of feelings yeah. right if we can pinpoint what the feeling is and really feel the core energy of the emotion just the core energy of the emotion, it takes maximum 90 seconds for it to dissipate. So when we say it takes longer because you're in the head, we are suffering because of the story. We are not going to the core energy of the emotion. So mm. it's a, this is a like really hard tool. Really, not everyone can do it because we have been severed from feeling our feelings when we were kids. So we don't know how to feel our feelings, believe it or not. We don't know how to be happy, how to be sad, how to be angry. We are just ruminating about these stories and we get frustrated in our head. We are not truly feeling the feelings, right? So yeah. these are all tools that our children will learn. Okay, I, the first thing I tell parents, just separate yourself physically if you can. If it's not a safety issue, just excuse yourself, take care of you. If we are really angry and our cortisol level is up, it takes one hour to, for the cortisol level to, to go down. Mm, like interesting. If we don't do anything about it. Yeah. It takes one hour to at least 20 minutes. You want to separate yourself and then do the tools, do mindful breathing. That's why my mindfulness is the number one tool in conscious parenting. If you don't know how to do mindful breathing, then we're literally out of control with, with, the, with the principles. We like the principles, right. but we don't know how to implement it. That's why we need to practice meditation. Wow. So that's, I love all of this. So that's fascinating what you said about like, if you can get to the core, 
and all um, and like separate the feeling from the story that you can uh, experience that emotion purely and then able to to overcome it that's so fascinating to me because like um I think a lot of people, we justify, we want to experience that feeling and want to keep ruminating over it, reliving it, experiencing it by retelling these stories again and again and again to try and justify this feeling. And so it like prolongs it, right? And it's, and, and then it carries with us. Like, so, so would you, so you said that most of us are triggered by feelings that we had between zero to six. So does that mean that during that time, did we form most of our stories in that time and now we're just yes. keep reacting to the same story? Yes. I just call it opening the file cabinet. We are uh -huh. repetitive creatures. We're practically robots. We think almost the same thoughts as yesterday. Um, most of them are fear-based. How many mm. thoughts do you think we have a day on average? I don't know, thousands, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, 50,000 on average, some, some people have wow. 100,000. So, and most of them are fear-based. So mm -hmm. when we are keep thinking about this, and where do they come from? From the stories, from our experiences, we're opening the file cabinet. So we're constantly thinking in previous thoughts. That's why by doing mindful breathing, we can maybe do it right now a little bit. We just learn to, our brain learns to detach from any thought, it doesn't matter what thought it is, just detach, and go back to your breath here or on your chest okay. or when you're eating just um, go back focus or bring your attention to the taste of the food in your mouth where are you tasting it is it the front of the mouth is it the back of the mouth the smell really smell or touch where are you touching so we use the um, present moment experience to anchor ourselves to the present moment and detach from the thought for example when you kiss your like when we kiss or hug we are still thinking what if I, what I tell my clients, like really smell their skin when you, when you kiss them, when you kiss and their, their cheek, like smell their hair, really touch the skin. And one of the, the, the tools that I um, give, number one tool is 20 second hugs. 20 mm -hmm. seconds, you want to keep it for 20 seconds. And then and research shows the 20 second hugs specifically, it uh, creates to um, produce oxytocin, which is the mm -hmm. happy hormone in our body. You want to keep the hug for 20 seconds. You want to feel. It's just heart to heart. Feel. No thoughts come. Let go. Go back to hug. To the sensation of the hug. To that smell or to that, you know, comfort. So we want to use the present moment experience to detach from any thoughts, which are mostly fear-based, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There either anxiety, there's a fear about the future, or there's a regret about the past. That's what we're living, right? Past and future. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. The present moment, if I look at this pen, I fully, fully pay attention to this pen and to the color. My work, working memory is so limited that I will not have any more capacity to think about a past or the future. I'm happy. Wow. Right? Wow. Okay. Okay. So what I hear you saying is like that mindfulness is basically being present. Like I think some people think when they hear this like term meditation mindfulness or or even bringing up buddhism or things like that like people think oh that must be some mystical art or something like that and i mean i've been studying meditation now for uh about i don't know three to five years or something like that and it's like I had no idea what it was before then. And so I'm kind of speaking to the audience of me five years ago, like <laughs> if I were to say, this is not something that is mystical or crazy or universe, like um, new age, anything like this is legitimately like there are studies that prove this idea. Like you're saying that when you can become present, then there's no way that you can, then you can, that you can dwell on these stories of the fear or of the past or regret from the past or fear of the future, you have to be present. And it, it can completely rewires your brain to start um, fighting against the depression and the anxiety and that fear. So I love all of this stuff. I totally geek out about it with you and this is awesome. So, but how does this relate to parenthood? Mm -hmm. That's a great or idea. Children. Yeah, great, great question. So, um, 
let's just do this practice because I want okay. you to and your audience to know um, what, what I mean by mindful breathing. Let's just close your eyes, take okay. one deep breath through your nose and out your mouth. Beautiful. One more time through your nose. Hold it and out your mouth. It's okay. Out your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> now I want you to just close your eyes and direct your attention to the sensation of your breath under your nose or on your chest so it goes up and down up and down just direct your attention there either your nose pick one which one do you pick nose or chest oh i i always listen to both okay just my chest i guess one pick one chest okay so just direct your attention don't focus too hard because you're going to get a headache just direct your attention to the rise and fall of your chest it goes up and down you can put your hand there first to just notice up and down. And now as soon as you are aware of a thought, because we are not, not aware of those 50,000 thoughts, because we are not wired for mindfulness. You are wired for mind wandering. And you're not aware of it. So as soon as you are aware, the more you do this, the more you become aware. As soon as you're aware, you detach very gently and you come back to that sensation of the breath on the chest. Up. Yeah. Oops, I'm thinking. Imagine the part of the cloud, let it pass, mm -hmm. and you're the sky. Let the let the thought pass. Come back to trust. Oops. Oops, I'm thinking. Imagine it's a wagon. <laughs> Don't let the those train. thoughts come in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just let the train pass. Come back to the sensation of the breath on your chest, on the back. On the breath. Beautiful. Now you can open your eyes and do the same. Just have a gaze, have a gaze at somewhere and then have that dual awareness. You're watching something, but you're actually directing your attention to the sensation of your chest. Mm -hmm. You can do that open eyes. So that's what, this is meditation. There's no yeah. mysticism in it, right? Yeah. So now when you do, if you do this five to 10 minutes a day, so this is the topic of my dissertation. I have researched mindfulness. So whatever I'm telling you is from science. So my dissertation is about having this kind of, the same thing that I just showed you in one minute. You can do that one minute, three, four times a day. Mm -hmm. But I highly suggest you start with five minutes in the morning and then throughout the day put reminders, just pause and just, Pay attention to your breath. You can even do it with open, open eyes. Even when you're driving, well, you can't, we can't, we can't drive here because we're in a lockdown, but um, like for <laughs> leisurely purposes. <Yeah>. But, um, <laughs> but you can do it with open eyes. Why is it important to do it every day? At least five to 10 minutes every morning and one minute throughout the day. I, my dissertation was a one minute mindful breathing micro breaks for well being, recovery from stress and present moment of attention. So it showed, I had 60 subjects, it showed that even taking three one minutes throughout the day will increase these things, right? So when we do that, we are wiring our brain for mindfulness because we said our, 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 our brain is wired for mind wandering, mm -hmm. not mindfulness, we are not aware, right? When we do this, our brain, after one week or two, when we've done this a couple of times a day, our brain learns to do this even in the moment when you're triggered with a child. Mm -hmm. Like at the moment, say, oh, no one listens to me in the room is such a mess. So I'm, I'm aware my brain can do this. Just create that space. It's just a cloud because I, I'm triggered. It's a cloud. Let it pass on the side. And you just observe. And guess what? When we observe and we don't react and we don't think, when you don't, don't attach to the thought, we are in between thoughts. Mm -hmm. When we are in between thoughts, we are open to receive what to say in a conscious way. We are mm -hmm. open to receive how to do things in in compassionate way. Does that make yeah. sense? Yep. Yep. Because I believe that I, um, you know, scientifically, quantum, physically, and all those things, that we know everything at all times. We just need to access it. Mm -hmm. All these thoughts that are from past to the future don't let us access that wisdom. So we have an inner guru in us. We know everything. Literally, we know everything. I, I can bring you an amazing example that I, you know, I could guess a number between zero and 50 
just by my heart, just by my mind, the, bo- the, the wisdom of my body. So just take it from me. It's kind of a spooky um, uh, exercise, so, you know, <laughs> I might not mention it now, but because I don't know your audience, but we take it from me. We know everything at all times. Mm. We just need to dismantle these thoughts from past and future, close the file cabinet, become open to receive, to know what to do at this moment. Wow. And then when we know, do you see this? Can you see this? Everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. Carl Jung. That's Carl Jung, right? This is psychology mm-hmm. 101, right? So when we are triggered, then I use that space first to take care of me and my inner child and then uh, proceed with compassionate boundaries. Maybe have a family meeting, maybe connect, connect, because we usually order people to do stuff, order kids, mm. especially kids, yeah. do stuff. And no one likes to be told what to do no one yeah. if i ask you to do your audience can can watch this or just hear yeah no i'm gonna put it on can watch it? youtube okay. and well, facebook yeah <laughs> yeah so th- this is a uh, this is an exercise from susan Stiffelman. she's awesome if you put push your right hand to your left hand I, i'm asking you to do it can you do that okay. push your right hand to your left hand push it okay push it push it push it you're doing it wrong why <laughs> I don't know. How am I doing it wrong? Because your left hand is pushing back. Oh, I see. Push. Say it again. So say the instructions again. Push your right hand to your left hand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh That's the correct. (laughs) So when they push, the people push back. Why? They're striving Mm -hmm. for, this is intrinsic. They're striving for their autonomy. When we tell them what to do, when we expect them to do things, they will strive for their, for their autonomy. Their autonomy is being violated. Yeah. So we have to find a way to connect, fill up that autonomy. One of the ways we fill up the autonomy bucket is to give choices. We don't usually give choices. So I highly suggest to challenge yourself to whatever you want to say, make, make it two choices. Ridiculous as it sounds, but you want to brush your teeth now or in five minutes, but give a choice. It oh. will fabricate that sense of autonomy in, in children. Oh, I'm in charge. I'm going to do it in five minutes. Okay. So I don't feel, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the way that I understand what you said was like that when you are mindful and you become aware of your feelings, it's almost like you're starting, you begin to recognize that your feelings are like separate things from you, from what you are capable of doing. So like those things that trigger you, you can stop and become aware and like, and almost like allow that feeling to like bring it outside of yourself and observe it and go, okay, why am I feeling this way? And then allow yourself to pause. And like you said, listen for the answer. Like, what should I really be doing in this situation? That so often, because when we're triggered, we become reactive. Those, the like stress hormones or those things that, that happen inside of our brain, we get into this fight, flight, or freeze state but when we allow when we allow ourselves to, to pause and become aware, then we can say, "Whoa, wait a second! I don't have to respond that way. I can, or I don't have to react that way. I can be responsive. Like I can be yeah. responsible for what my re- my reaction is." And so, exactly. yeah, I love that a lot. And because, and then the more you practice it, the the easier it gets. That's why, like I you said, that. like you said, I love that you said five to ten minutes every morning, and then pause maybe as frequently as you can to just yeah. become aware of and observe what am I doing right now? What are my thoughts doing? What am I experiencing? And I, you know, this is something that I wish that I'd known earlier when my kids were little, I was just actually lamenting um, how much I was like, man, I wish I were more present when my kids are babies because I missed their babiness. You know, <laughs> I missed that. But, you know, um, so I kind of had a more moment of grief and they're like, <laughs> Oh, I missed that, you know, but, um, but now that I know it now, it's like, okay, now I want to become more aware so that I can be present with them and grow with them and, and be, you know, be able to experience life with them. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and also to honor who they are, like, cause I like what you said here about giving them autonomy. We all want autonomy and that, the lo- loss of our autonomy and our freedom creates more stress. <laughs> and so it, that's something that you're then, if you take away that autonomy from your children, you're then 
creating stories and creating the triggers that one day they're going to respond to later on, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Because we are reacting to our sense of lack of autonomy as we were kids yeah. because they are not listening and we feel I don't have power. Yeah. You see the site, it's a vicious cycle. Then we yeah, are projecting in the, on, on them and then they're going to have it to their uh, loved ones when they grow. So, um, and then what you said is exactly true. So Dr. Dan Siegel has this brain model. So this is the ego or fight or flight mechanism. And this is the smart brain. When we flip the lid, the smart brain is completely off the chart. Hmm. So we better. Okay. Yeah. It, when kids are throwing tantrum, just be there, create the space for them to feel their feelings. Don't be afraid of your kid's feelings. Don't be afraid your own, of your own feelings, right? It's okay. Yeah. Let them cry. Let them cry, but be there for them. Yeah. Don't abandon them. Just be there. For, you don't even have to say anything. And you, you, can, you can just create that love in your heart because scientifically shown, we have an electromagnet, the largest electromagnetic field around our heart, up to three feet, that will affect people. So if I have that love and acceptance and empathy i'm not taking on their misery i'm just i'm just having empathy i'm i'm there and i'm accepting yeah. them and i'm that i'm i'm okay with them going through the the hardship part of the problem with that especially moms is that we want our kids to be happy that's not our job yeah admit yeah. yourself per, like remove yourself from this position that you need to make yourself you know, make your kids happy the only person you are responsible for is yourself yeah you don't need to make anyone happy right mm -hmm. so uh victor frankl said between stimulus and response there is a space in that space is our power to choose our response in our response light our growth and our freedom that's yeah. the space we want to access by doing mindful breathing because our brain learns if you don't do mindfulness uh, meditation mindful eating mindful walking mindful watching i i have read this book the joyful wisdom a couple of years ago by this month, it seemed as if I never saw a tree before this book. Because he asked us to look at the tree. I'm like, I was amazed by a tree for two weeks. I'm like, whoa, wow, look at the clouds. It's like, I never saw anything. Yeah. Right. That, so if we don't do that with our brain, our brain doesn't learn to create that space that cycle is, is talking about. You want to create that space where we are accessing that between thoughts, wisdom. Right. And then, um, again, because all those thoughts, the, everything originates from the thought. So um, thoughts create yeah. feelings and feelings create behaviors. So yeah. everything originates from the thoughts. We can, one of the things I, I suggest is to flip the thoughts, like grab the thought and you cannot grab it if you haven't done mindful breathing again, because mm -hmm. you're not aware. You have to do that. That's, see, that's the foundation. So you grab the thought. What is the thought? No one listens to me in this house. Now you question, everyone listens to me in this house. If I'm connecting, for example, or that's not true, not, you know, they listen to you most of the time. Maybe one time they don't listen. We overgeneralize, we catastrophize the situation. Do you see what I'm saying? So we can yep. flip the thought. That's the work by Byron Katie. We flip the thought. Mm -hmm. We really flip the verb. We flip the pronoun. He should not be yelling um, at his, um, I don't know, sibling. I should not be yelling at him. Yeah. So I'm flipping the pronouns, right? She should not throw a tantrum. I should not throw a tantrum because apparently I'm throwing an adult tantrum too. Does that make yeah. sense? Uh -huh. So it, you will flip the thought, right? And then we create that space. We want to, one of the, the fundamental things I teach is that behavior is a symptom. Mm -hmm. Any behavior is a form of communication. Yeah. We traditionally, in traditional parenting with behavioristic parenting, timeouts, you know, rewards, punishments, I don't do any of them. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in them. And the whole school system is based on it. I don't, be, because I believe behaviorism was based on animals. And it works well with children with autism. But normally, that should not be our main tool. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So we, when a kid asks somehow, that's just a form of communication. We are the adult because believe it or not, the brain gets fully developed until we are 25. 25, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they have very underdeveloped brain. Their brainwave frequency is so low up until 12 years old. It's like they're in hypnosis, mm -hmm. right? 
we are the adults with these fully developed brains, hopefully. So we are Powerless. here <laughs> to, to coach them, right? To figure yeah. out what's the behavior instead of manipulating the, the behavior. Stop crying, you put in your room, why you're hitting, why you're biting. That's just a form of communication. The child is hurting inside, doesn't know. There's lack of skill. There's um, lack of autonomy. There's lack of connectedness. There's lack of competence. There's three basic psychological needs. So we are the detectives here. We have to put on our detective hat to see what's going on instead of looking at the behavior and get upset and take it personally. We're going to create that space, connect to our inner child, feel our feelings. So we are able to now be, be the adult, be the coach to figure out what to do. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone's going to be little children because when we get upset, really our ego was formed from zero to six years old. We become little children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Wow. So we want mm -hmm. to be the adult. We want to have our smart brain and new cortex activated. Yep. Their new cortex is completely off the chart. We need to be their new cortex, their smart brain. Right. Does that wow. make sense? So yeah. Yes. It's like a. It's like a iceberg. I, I love symptom. iceberg. So the five percent is behavior, hitting, mm -hmm. biting, not listening, and then under. 95%, am I loved? Am I worthy? Am I safe? Am I uh, being heard? Can I do this? Do I matter? Do I have a choice? Do I belong? Right? And also, anger is a protection. If they're angry, if we are angry, there's our source of overwhelm, depressed, rejected, embarrassed, scared, all those things are under. So we want to see under. It's like yeah. we have these x-ray visions to figure out what's under. Then we don't take it personally. Then we don't get triggered. We say, okay, the brain is not working right now properly in a you know high function way. Yeah. Let me at least be the, the the brain, not just throw tantrum and get triggered and you know punish and yell and all those things. Yeah. Because it's going to be a vicious cycle, and then there will be no cooperation. There will be only power struggle. This is a yep. power struggle, um, and then we are losing our peace. Mm hmm. Wow. Okay. I love all this so much because, you know, talking about family culture and the way the, the culture that we create is the overall feeling and it's the norms. It's the things that we default to, you know? And so like when we automatically default to our triggers, we automatically default to being reactive, then that becomes normal. And then that becomes our culture. So to become mindful to allow ourselves that space and become more and more mindful to pause and become connected and to listen for what we can do in response to, and, and teach and mentor our children to, to, um, think without, you know, to, to get our thinking brains in charge or our, our logical side of our brains or, or, you know, I've heard so many different renditions of like the, the monkey brain versus the, you know, or the ego versus the, the thinking brain or the conscious brain, you know, and, because they don't have that developed yet. And what, what comes to my mind also while you were talking was one of the things that I believe is so important to our family culture and establishing something that we need to establish as our norm is figuring out and learning how to establish trust and cultivating trust. And when our children see us triggered and getting reactive when they get angry and when we get angry, you know, these kinds of things, it starts to deteriorate that trust. and when we create space for them, that strengthens the trust. Um, I, I just started reading a book called The um, Self-Driven Child. And it talked about like what you said, that allowing our children freedom, it's okay for them to, to experience these, the stress. It's okay for them to experience those feelings, but they also need us to be close by in order to um, create a safe space for them to uh, digest those feelings. You know, it's yeah. not like we're, they, when kids experience trauma or stress, they're able to recover from it when they have their parents there mentoring them and helping them to get them. through it. Accepting them, accepting them. Yes, right? exactly. So, so when we that get triggered, you're telling them- trust. <laughs> yes, so we, when we are triggered, we are telling you, you're, they think I'm bad. They yeah. not only think, I, this is going to be really dramatic, but it's true. They not only think I'm not lovable, they think I'm not livable. Right. I deserve to die because we are their main caregivers. 
So they really deserve in their in their deep in their psyche they think they don't deserve to live. Right. This is really dramatic. So when we do that to them, we are telling them when you have big big feelings, you're not accepted. Right. I don't love you. Change. Right. So by creating that space, we're allowing them to move through their healthy feelings. Yep. All these emotions, these feelings, are, um, I have a little uh, slide about that too. So they, they, they are authentically feeling their feelings. They're okay, okay, I'm mad. It doesn't mean I'm bad. Yep. Right? So can you see? Yeah. So we have these are, so this is, I didn't get this from academia, but I, I really believe it. Um, so grief, anger, fear, envy, love. These are healthy feelings, healthy yep. human feelings. If we don't feel them, they turn, grief turns into depression, anger turns into rage, fear turns into panic, envy turns into jealousy, and love turns into possessiveness, where we want to hoard, wow. we want to buy stuff. We can't, when we don't express our love and real fully. Um, so when we are telling you, oh, you shouldn't be sad because I'm uncomfortable, the same thing that happened to us when we were kids, right? I, because I, the parents get uncomfortable when the child is crying or yelling or wants something. I get uncomfortable because I feel I'm not a good parent. I haven't done good. Like my parent, my child, who's an extension of me, which is, by the way, a principle of conscious parenting. Our children are not ours. It just came through us. But we feel they're ours. The extension, like Dr. Shafali calls mini-me. They're like mini-me. So uh -huh. we, they're like a prize. So whatever happens to them, it's like it's happening to us. But guess what? We're separate. We're separate souls. We are just here together to usher each other, not me and them, and usher them because I said they have less written programming, so they can usher yeah. me more even. <laughs> yeah. I my son tells me he's ten. Like when I get upset, like he says things, and I'm like, "Are you fifty? Like he says things that I'm like so wise. So he's teaching me. I call him my yep. spirit guide for re for real. So this conscious parenting says they are our teachers, are our teachers, but I call them my spirit guide because he sees things so well when he's not on the screen. So my role as an older adult who knows about addiction, for example, screening, that's a big problem right now that kids are in the house. That's addiction. They don't get that. But mm -hmm. an addicted person needs intervention. Needs an intervention, right. right? So in that department, I know better. So yeah. I'm going to set rules, I'm going to set boundaries, no phones, no videos, no nothing, go do, it's okay to be bored. So part of the thing, um, so I'm, I'm going to have a, a free Zoom call tonight at five o'clock. Um, you can put, put it if people want to come, it's just free Zoom call. I'm going to talk about how we can handle this, you know, frustration at home yeah. with, with them. Uh, as I said, we have a lockdown. I don't think, do you have a lockdown or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we can okay. go to the grocery store, but you know, everything else is closed basically. It's closed. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'm saying that, um, why did I bring that up anyway? I wanted to About say screens something. and we need to do an intervention screens. and we need to, uh, yes. to, to teach our children about addiction to screens. Yes. I, yes. I, I yes. 100% agree. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it's, I have researched so much about screening. So I have so much passion about this. Dr. Shifal even says, Use your authority for screening. <laughs> we have to. We shouldn't use our authority for everything. For everything else, we go for win-win. Uh, we have very few rules. But for everything else, we go for win-win. Uh, even for, for screening, we, come, we go for that route. For example, I was, we have regular family meetings. And you know what? This is damaging to your brain. You don't get it. I show them all the research, but they forget because it's just so stimulating all these colors yeah. and games and social media that and way. TikTok and <laughs> yeah. right so um so I I constantly have those um family meetings to make them know that you know I'm not a mean guy I'm tr trying to protect your brain and that what can we do let's make it work and yeah. they uh, and I said half an hour and they said one hour I said fine you see so we come up with something like that. At, at the same time, I don't let them. Exactly. But again, I'm the authority in this uh, area yeah. because this is addiction. Yeah. Well, I also believe in um, moderating in a way that we encourage production versus consumption so much. You know, like if you're going to use social media, do it to 
put something out into the world that's good and productive and, and useful, not just go on to consume and scroll and be brain dead. Like that's Mm -hmm. for, for our family. Like we, we try to encourage like, okay, if you're going to use media, use it to be productive, do, if you're going to do it, then you use like a learning tool or something like that. If you're going to consume, but otherwise, like it needs to be productive, like do something that you're going to add to to the culture of, uh, you know, cause people are going to be consuming. It's just the way that our, you know, our culture is right now. And so I think that it's important to teach our children to be producers, not just. Yeah, I agree, but I don't agree with uh, social media because social media, the beast, I, in, in no way I believe that children, um, Oh no. Under yeah. 18 are ready for social. Like this is, yeah, um, I agree with that. this is a plague. This is a plague. Um, and like I'm okay like I'm I'm more okay with my son being on a game than my daughter being on TikTok because oh, yeah. it not only it's you know the brain damaging but it's actually working so um sabotagingly underneath her psyche I'm not good enough I'm not oh, yeah. um you know uh, tall enough I'm not blonde enough I'm not you know popular enough or this guy has so many likes that guy has so so it it works so um destructively underneath yeah. psychologically so um, it's so subtle too yeah it's so i have other i have for those of you listening i have a, several, a few other episodes of people who have talked about the <laughs> social media destructive of media and media literacy i think it's something really important to bring into your family culture so that you're aware like you said that of these things because of the subtlety of the way that marketers and create producers of these digital devices they intend for us to become addicted to them and the way that social media and marketing works is that it's intended to also make us feel bad so that we want to buy their buy their stuff so yeah yeah, we don't want to send those messages to our kids like it's so destructive so yeah if kids are going to use screens in our house we only use screens for education purposes like good great that's it I salute and you. So. <laughs> so I'm not saying that I'm anyway. not saying that we shouldn't. So I have to buy the phone for my kids because she was crying for two months. Every, all my friends, we have to give in, but at least be, be aware. Yeah. So I'm not telling you that you shouldn't and you're a bad person if you should. And I join myself, but at least yeah. be aware. Have your boundary. One day you give it. For example, I give it one day and I see that she, she sees it herself that she can't control. And then I take it away for 20 days, you know? But at, at least I'm aware. I let it. Yeah. I don't want her to starve either. But then I see that, you know, how it's affecting her. She sees that. And, and when you brought up culture, it was so important that, you know, we don't, we don't um, really think of this really um, uh, ha- seriously that mm. joy is our birthright. Peace is our birthright. If, in a, as you said, like in a culture, everyone's yelling, that becomes the norm. Mm-hmm. Are we joyful? We are really, com- it's, that's our comfort zone. Maybe yep. we were yelled at in, you know, when we were children. So we subconsciously created this, you know, this um, family. So we are comfortable. Yep. So I was, that's what we know. But really our birthright is to have joy. Our birthright is to have peace. That's the most important thing. So if I'm not at peace, we have two states at all times, love or fear. Love has peace mm-hmm. for the moment, all those things, and fear is just lack and anger and, you know, shame and judgment. At any time, we have to become aware. Again, go back to mindfulness to become aware. Where am I I'm vibrating? Am I yeah. vibrating on low fear? Am I vibrating high on love? And yeah. then switch. Do your feeling your feeling. Do your flipping your thoughts. Do your connecting. Figure out what's going on. Use humor, playfulness. For example, yesterday, my daughter was so mad at me. She said, you were the worst mom. And I just did that to her. And she said, don't touch me. And I did that to her and everyone. And she, she started smiling. I used humor. I didn't take it personally. She said, you're the, you're the worst mom. And believe yeah. me, Dr. Shafali here is that from her child too. And she only has one. So if Dalai Lama had children, this would be the case. So <laughs> but how do we deal with it? We don't take it personally. We connect our hearts. Okay, if I'm not triggered, which it means, okay, good, I don't have a wound. But if I'm getting triggered, I have a wound. Let me connect and then mm-hmm. connect to them. What's going on, honey? Are you out of hug? You want to do it together? You want to do the room together? Okay, do this part. Oh, let's do this in two minutes. Let's um, put a timer. Can we do this in two minutes? Let's jump to tooth brushing. Like, be, become creative. 
right? Yeah. There is no yeah. one time fit, one size fit all, but when we are closing the file cabinet, we are open to receive how to do things creatively, playfully, with humor, silliness, um, connection. That's the bottom line. Connection mm -hmm. is the key word. We need to connect. We don't want to come at people. We yeah. want to connect. Honey, you don't want to do your, no, your homework right now? It's okay. You can, you, we can do it in five minutes. You want to do that? You know, just be light, especially right now. And I'm sure you know, we, um, you know, I, I read an article that academically, we need only like a maximum two hours for academics at home in order to equate it to school. So we shouldn't, you know, just have a loose structure at home, especially now. And have a couple of grounding things like I don't know, sleeping at the if it's you know the same time you they slept at before maybe if if that's something you value a lot, um, I don't know jumping up and down a little bit of you know physical education yeah you know, that those could be grounding um, activities throughout the day but for mm, the rest yeah, let's like just that. be flexible be adaptable and I wanted to mention this tonight um, so have like alternate independent work because we have to work too right yep. they, that you use things for them okay this is the you know painting area this is the school area this, so they go independent work i do independent work and then we connect after one hour we connect we're gonna do i don't know jump up and down be silly dance something connecting again go independent again connected so independence connection independence mm -hmm. connection independent. and if in the middle they need something that I love this. Uh, so they just come, they put their hands on your shoulder. You put your hands on their hand and saying, okay, so you do, you finish your thing and say, what, honey, what's going on? So they know this one hour is for the independent work. There's also an structure. Wow. I love that so much. That was something that I, I love learning about was learning that we, our energy ebbs and flows. And that is time, you know, when we start to feel that energy starting to lull, then it's like, okay, time to disrupt and do something else. And so like, yeah. cause that is something that can trigger you too. It's just feeling like my energy is starting to lull. And then next thing you know, you're, react you're reactive to everything. Right. And so it's like, I love that. That's awesome. That's a really mm. good. So awesome. I, I love everything you're talking about. I think we could go on forever and ever. <laughs> I just, I just love the, this whole topic is just it's so important. It, it will completely transform your relationship with your children, with, with every, your, all your relationships really. And with yourself, I think that it's so important when like you're talking about being able to separate ourselves and our labels of, of things and emotions from who we are, right. You know, and being able to see and recognize our children and the things that they are experiencing, separating that from who they are and just okay, how can I respond to this lovingly to connect with them, to help them to become aware or just to sit with this, sit with this, get uncomfortable. It's okay to sit in this discomfort of boredom or anger or sadness or grief or all these things and be present with them so that you can help them work through it rather than it becoming such an issue. You know, there was one book that I read that was like stress coupled with trauma becomes disordered behavior. And so if you don't address that stress or that behavior in a loving, compassionate way to give them that space to feel it and recover from it, then it can become trauma. And then it becomes, mm -hmm. you know, that the stress of, you know, if a child behavior, um, or maybe it was like a behavior coupled with trauma. Anyways, if a child is like, they feel stress and they used to be kind of organized that becomes OCD when they become traumatized, you know, things like that. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but it's like something that I think about sometimes when I'm like, all right, when my child is experiencing stress, sometimes all they need is for me to just be present with them and yeah. that will help them to work through it. And how always wow. actually. Yeah. 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 So it's um, a great mantra. I use a lot of mantras. Those are really good to interrupt patterns. This too shall pass because our mm. ego thinks this is the end of the world because this is fight or flight. Remember this was made when tigers attacked us, life or right. death. So even in this, you know, this current time, 21st century, it becomes life or death. So we, we can say this too shall pass, not a life or death situation. Just allow, it will pass. Yeah. We think it's going to remain, it's going to be permanent. That's why we want to, you know, change things and fix things and lecture, but it will pass. Yeah. Then we can talk about it and talk about the behavior later, right? Wow. 
That's awesome. So where can we find you, Dr. Raya, and learn more about mm -hmm. this? Sure. So my website um, is draraya.com. And my uh, Facebook is Dr. Ari, my Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere. Um, so um, yeah, and tonight I'm gonna have a free Zoom call talking about you know this this hard time. Um, maybe I can send you the link and you can put it somewhere if they access it, okay. they can jump in. It's just no registration; they just come in. And um, and what else? And they can um, anyone who's watching or hearing this, if you would like to have. A 30 minute free consultation with me you can do that at drari.com you can go ahead and um, make your appointment for 30 minute consultation and um, yes i'm happy to serve awesome are you gonna hold those those um those live conferences um uh, frequently more often well this is the first time i'm doing because because of this i actually bought um you know zoom pro i did not zoom pro so because i think <laughs> i'll probably do it more but i i'm i'm creating some online courses okay. um as you know and um you know i might do four session zoom classes uh as far as free zoom calls i have i have also a parent support group if you if that's free uh okay. parent parent from love so facebook that's a group parent from love that's um, okay. like a free parent support uh i used to go there a lot every week uh, but um so i go sometimes now um and um yeah I'm, yeah i, I answer questions uh with you know with the live face live and all those things but i'll see everything is evolving right now so yeah we'll see how it, yeah. yeah i look forward to seeing how it evolves i think that this is just just it's so important and so i am rooting for you this is amazing to be able oh, to to share this stuff is awesome and so important to bring these things to our awareness we can learn about it and we can start to shape our culture in our families and then how our culture you know how we impact our culture around us because yeah. you know that's one of those things like i love that quote from um mother Teresa that if you want to change the world go home and love your family love the family yeah. It, it matters. I, you know, I think we're, gonna, we're seeing that right now with the, with the coronavirus lockdown is that it's like, we can impact and we need to impact our families because that's who we're, we're going to come back to when there's a crisis or whatever, you know, whatever, like our families are so crucial and we can impact our culture at large by, by creating that culture inside our families. So yes, awesome. So, yeah. so thank you so much for being here, yeah. Dr. Arroyo. Thank you for being You're very welcome. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, you too.